starts right now. In many ways, he tied San Antonio to the Trump campaign. But amid problematic poll numbers tonight, Brad Parscale is no longer the president's right-hand campaign man. The shakeup announced by the president on social media tonight. So will Parscale come back home to San Antonio, or is there still a place for him in the campaign? It's coming up, but first. We've got breaking news from the north side tonight. One person shot is critically injured. Police investigating a shooting near O'Connor and Loop 1604, but they have not released a lot of details yet. Yeah, Sky 12, as you can see, is over the scene tonight. This is happening in the 15,900 block of Redwoods Manor. I know it's kind of hard to see out there in the dark, but we understand this is happening at a home where the garage is open. Yeah, you can see the garage door open and investigators there. Again, at least one person shot. We have a crew on the way. Hope to have more details coming up shortly. A quickly developing situation in the Alamo City. We are two weeks into July and have added nearly 10,000 cases of COVID-19 in that time period. The number of deaths nearly doubling in that amount of time. Take a look at where we are or where we were. That is back on June 30th. We had 12,065 cases and 110 deaths. These numbers are growing from March to the end of June. Two weeks later, we now have a total of 21,546 cases. Our death toll has risen to 208 tonight. The numbers showing the tremendous and dangerous spread of COVID-19 in such a short amount of time. Mayor Ron Nuremberg making it clear schools in San Antonio will be facing a modified opening. But let me be very clear with you. Uh, schools are not ready to open in August in person. Mayor Nuremberg announcing a task force created to discuss how schools will operate amid this pandemic. That task force announced after the Texas Education Agency says public health officials can decide if schools should remain closed without risking state education funding. The task force is made up of teachers, parents, students, teachers unions, school districts, pediatricians and public health officials. That team is set to meet as early as tomorrow and Mayor Ron Nuremberg expects to have guidance out for the school districts by early next week. And when asked why not make the decision to keep schools closed now, the mayor said the challenge is balancing the resources and the needs of 17 school districts with the students who depend on them. For example, some students rely on schools for food and emotional and behavioral support. Coming up, we're going to speak with Mayor Ron Nuremberg live in our KSAT Q&A coming up around 1035. Today, Judge Nelson Wolf extending his executive order restricting gatherings and requiring businesses to post mask requirements on their buildings. The fines associated with violations also extended until August the 12th. The state's order forcing bars to close is also still in effect, but the Texas Restaurant Association hopes to amend that order. The night team Stephen Cavazos with the push to redefine certain bars and restaurants. We may not be able to handle it in 30 days if something doesn't change. We may just put the, the going out business on out there. Michael Specia is the owner of Highlander Bar and Grill, an establishment that's been in business off Fredericksburg Road for almost 14 years. Specia says the location is not just known for its drinks, but also its food, which is why he was taken back when he learned doors would have to close. I just had a huge food order come in, and he gave us exactly three hours. We had to close down at 12. Specia closed his dining room and bar, but still offered food and drinks to go. But on Saturday, he was issued this citation from the Development Services Department. According to the city's website, two people were seen drinking at the location during a follow-up inspection. Specia claims he was told earlier in the week he was in compliance, but was still forced to close. It's just, it's, it's confusing on both ends because you have the same entity in San Antonio. And I have two or three different messages. The Texas Restaurant Association is showing support for businesses like Specia's. In a letter issued to Governor Abbott, the organization has proposed criteria that it believes should allow these types of businesses to operate, have an operational kitchen during business hours, has multiple entrees, and the space to allow for social distancing. Specia says Highlanders has the kitchen and the menu, but he's unsure if business will return. We put a big investment on being a restaurant. But people like to come here and eat, eat a hamburger. Can't do it anymore. Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News.
The Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission considers Highlanders a bar because their liquor sales outweigh their goods sales. But Spisa says that changed when the pandemic began. Customers are now showing up for food to go. Our hospital system remains stressed tonight, and while the number of people hospitalized has gone down slightly, more people are needing treatment in the intensive care units. There are now 1,231 people in the hospital, but 438 people are now in the ICUs and 274 are on ventilators, helping them breathe. We remain at 11% of staffed hospital beds available. And more deaths at our hospitals means more strain on their morgue capacity. Metro Health Assistant Director Mario Martinez says San Antonio and Bear County have two refrigerator trailers that can hold up to 24 to 36 bodies each. We got our first look at those trailers today. Martinez says they would have staff on hand to maintain the correct temperature as well as security to keep them protected. The goal is to work with funeral homes to help with the transfer of bodies. These individuals are our family members and, and friends, and we can't emphasize enough the the precaution measures that we've stated before and will repeat again that wearing the face covering it does work. Another three refrigerated trailers expected to be up and running in the city by the end of this week. Martinez says some hospitals have also put in orders for more refrigerated trailers. As COVID-19 continues to spread in our community, nursing homes are still a concern. Metro Health says 43 residents have died at local nursing homes since the start of the pandemic. Statewide, more than 1,100 have died. Nursing homes and other long-term care facilities have been on lockdown since March. The night team's Tiffany Huerta spoke to one woman who hasn't seen her mother in person in four months. She doesn't understand that I can't go visit her, my brother can't visit her, my sister. Monica Alonso can only see her 90-year-old mother through the window. We try to go out there and put signs for her. We did a parade for her birthday. Her mother, Maria Curiel Huerta, is at Silver Creek Manor. It's not the staff's fault. It's not any of the facility's fault. It's understandably, you know, they're just trying to take precautions for, you know, our loved ones. At the start of the pandemic, federal and state rules were put in place to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. The state put precautions in place to restrict people coming in and out of buildings um, in order to protect the residents. We spoke to Adante Assisted Living and Memory Care located on the north side to see what changes it made. Screening everyone that is deemed essential to work um, here with a temperature check, questionnaire whenever they arrive. We're monitoring everyone for symptoms. Windsor says families who want to see their loved ones can either do a virtual visit or window visit. She says staff wear masks all the time and residents also wear masks if they are outside their apartments. Because of the changes, she says no residents have contracted COVID-19, but only one staff member has tested positive. If a resident does get COVID-19, we would have a designated team for them um, that wouldn't be interacting with our other residents, just with our COVID positive residents um, to be sure that they're kept safe. Until there's a cure, you know, we all have to be unified to try to come up with creative ways to think of our seniors. Metro Health has a list on its website of nursing home facilities with COVID-19 cases. Currently, about 30 facilities have active cases. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The city of San Antonio is not responsible for overseeing nursing homes or assisted living facility. The state actually regulates them. Metro Health does help with testing and reducing the spread. A shakeup on the Trump campaign trail. Brad Parscale, who at one time called San Antonio hometown, now replaced as campaign manager. You might remember he ran President Donald Trump's digital advertising and website in 2016 and was credited for helping bring victory that year. The Associated Press reporting their working relationship has been strained since this event in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where turnout for a rally was low. The Trump campaign also experienced shrinking poll numbers against former Vice President Joe Biden. On Facebook tonight, the president saying Bill Stepien will be taking on the role of campaign manager. He went on to say, quote, Brad Parscale, who has been with me for a very long time and has led our tremendous digital and data strategies, will remain in that role while being a senior advisor to the campaign. 
Both were heavily involved in our historic 2016 win, and I look forward to having a big and very important second wind to get win rather together. End quote. I sat down with Parscale back in April of last year. At that time, he said he felt good about the Trump campaign in 2020. We have posted a link to that interview online at ksat.com. You can find that interview and the latest on the shakeup on our homepage. The congressional race for District 23 remains tight tonight. Tony Gonzalez edged out Raul Reyes Jr. by a mere seven votes, but that could change as election officials are still counting outstanding ballots. The race comes after a Republican incumbent, Will Hurd, chose not to run again. Gonzalez had the backing of President Trump, but it only led to a slim lead last night. Reyes won much of the district west of San Antonio that's considered more conservative. Reyes saying in a Facebook post he owed it to his campaign to fight to the end. Reyes did not say whether that meant a possible recount. Still ahead on the night beat, Fiesta canceled. So what's next for the number of nonprofits that it benefits? Could it mean a cut to programs or layoffs? And new pictures posted within the Trump administration following the Goya backlash. The latest coming up. And new video now in from a house fire north of Fiesta, Texas. What firefighters are telling us next on the night beat. New tonight, crews called out to a house fire just north of Six Flags Fiesta, Texas. This is on the 19,000 block of Strauss. A neighbor in that area caught the flames on camera. Firefighters say the two-story home was under renovation but was not occupied at the time of the fire. Flames were first seen upstairs. That fire is now out and no injuries were reported, but the roof did collapse. No word on what caused the fire. A person remains in the hospital tonight after suffering severe burns during a house fire. The fire broke out this afternoon at a home on Virginia Boulevard and St. Anthony Avenue on the city's east side. The home is considered a total loss. The fire department says the person was trying to save their pets when the fire broke out. A cause remains under investigation. The very latest now on COVID-19 across the state, more than 282,000 cases confirmed, 129,657 remain active. More than 3,000 deaths have been reported. Chief of the Texas Division of Emergency Management, Nim Kidd, says medical teams have been sent to San Antonio to help at several hospitals, while another medical team is helping in Houston. A third team expected to be dispatched to the Rio Grande Valley where their hospitals are also overwhelmed. A force to switch gears. Local nonprofits are now turning to the community for help after the cancellation of Fiesta. More than 100 nonprofits that count on the events surrounding the 11 day party with a purpose are left with holes in their budget. The nine teams Patty Santos tells us for some it may mean a cut to programs or layoffs. Not having Fiesta and then not having your gala. It's 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 a it's a double whammy. Bright and essay provides developmental services for children with disabilities or delays. It raises about seven hundred thousand dollars through a taste of the North Side event during Fiesta. The agency serves about thirty five hundred kids in Bear County and needs to fundraise about one point six million dollars each year. We have minimized expenses. Cuts to programs and staff are not out of the question if the community doesn't respond to their plans. Old fashioned fundraising, getting on the phone, calling these people. We're already we're already starting that process. We have a strong belief that it's best to give when it's hardest to give. The Texas Cavaliers say they're committed to raising more than two million dollars for the 68 charities they support. So many of the citizens of San Antonio are buckled down, worried about their businesses. Um, we feel that we have a responsibility. Uh, to give and to support. Their fundraising takes place year round. The River Parade during Fiesta is their gift to a charity. But putting them in the limelight, limelight and giving them the exposure through the television and the attention that they get is helpful to their other fundraising efforts. The Texas Cavaliers say they will honor parade tickets purchased this year for next year's parade. Brighton SA says about $100,000 in pre-sold tickets this year have been donated back to the nonprofit. Patty Santos, KSET 12 News. I want to get back to that breaking news from the north side tonight. Police now saying a domestic violence incident led to this shooting. 
Again, it's in the 15,900 block of Redwoods Manor. That's near O'Connor and Loop 1604. They've not released any other details, though. Yeah, officers say they got a call about a disturbance. They responded to the home but didn't find any activity. After police left, they say a man came back and confronted an ex-girlfriend at that home. The woman's father then confronted the man with a gun. That father told police the man lunged at him, forcing him to shoot. That man was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Police say they are still investigating this incident. Let's take a live look outside right now with live cams. Still very hot out there, very steamy day at 89 degrees. And we did it again today. Well, we tied a record. We didn't break a record. Okay. We okay. tied a record. but Better than breaking it. <laughs> we still reached a record, let's put it that way. And, you know, temperatures are going to be dropping off just a little bit. We'll be trimming off a few degrees here and there in the days ahead with a minimal chance of rain. It's your typical quiet July weather pattern, but we do have a lot to talk about in our atmosphere and even in outer space and much more. Look at this, another ISS space station flyover, Comet Neowise to talk about, and increasing dust. So all of that starting right now. First, if you missed the space station flyover earlier this evening, you have another shot tomorrow. 8.56 p.m. It's going to last six minutes. This one's going to be almost directly overhead with a max height of 88 degrees. So tomorrow evening, 8.56 p.m., get the kids outside. We'll have a clear sky. Look to the southwest. All right, that's the next space station flyover. That's going to be pretty easy to see here in San Antonio. Take a look at this great shot from professional photographer Mike Jones. And the reason I point that out is because this is Comet Neowise. And it really takes professional equipment to capture a photo like this. If you go out there with the naked eye, it's not going to look like this, okay? But. No, you're not going to get it on your iPhone and it's not going to look like this, but with the right equipment, long exposure and whatnot, and if you know exactly where to look, you can catch a glimpse of it. So he takes some great photos and this is what he captured yesterday in comfort. Also comfort outside of city light. So in order to really even see this comet, you have to get outside one hour after sunset. So that's about 930 PM and you look off to the northwest, very low on the horizon, away from city lights, away from light pollution because it's dim. And as the days go by, it's going to get a little bit higher in the sky, but at the same time, get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So it's not the easiest comet to see, but give it a shot. One hour after sunset, look to the northwest, very low on the horizon in a wide open area where you can capture that, uh, that vantage point. 102, high temperature today. That tied the record. Average being 94, 100 across the vast majority of South Texas. We're triple digits at or above 100. Catula and Del Rio, well, they were the hot spots at 106. Laredo, not, har not far behind at 105 earlier today. Right now, we have some 80s and 90s. 90 Carrizo Springs, 89 New Braunfels, 97 still in Del Rio, and 82 currently in Beeville. So let's fast forward to tomorrow morning. We'll wake up to temperatures largely in the mid to upper 70s, and then by the afternoon, we're going to shave off another, another few degrees. So we're thinking 100 here in San Antonio, Eagle Pass 102 along with Del Rio, and about 103 in Catula. And going forward, we continue to just take off a few degrees, and we'll be in the upper 90s by Friday into the upcoming weekend. As for the overall weather pattern, upper level high, still really in control of our weather along the edge of it there in New Mexico, North Texas, a few showers. But there is one feature that's giving us our minimal rain chance. It's a good soaking rain right now. Gulf coastline, panhandle of Florida. Well, that feature is going to head our way, lose a lot of its luster and at best a 20% chance east of I-35 on Friday. So we had a little bit of dust in the air today. You probably noticed that with the extra haze. Now, as we get into Friday and Saturday, I'm expecting a higher concentration and even more noticeable dust in our air again Friday, Saturday. All right, here's your day planner tomorrow. It's a few clouds in the morning, otherwise another sunny and hot day. 77 in the morning, 92 at noon, 100 the high temperature. There's that slight chance mainly along the coastal plain on Friday and we're only giving it a 20%. And then temperatures at least just barely below 100. Thank you barely. so much, Adam. Yeah, thank you. All right, so what I can tell from this interview, Pop decided to let the hair grow and the opinions flow. That's right. right, and we're talking about his opinion about the leadership of Texas, who, like Florida, where he's located now inside the NBA bubble, is having an alarming increase in coronavirus cases. When we come back, Pop unloads on Texas leadership 
and high school football facing delays and quite possibly worse than that coming up. Spurs head coach Greg Popovich unloading on Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick in his second interview since arriving at the NBA bubble in Orlando, Florida. At 71, Pop is considered high risk for the coronavirus, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Pop was asked about being in Florida, which, like Texas, has seen a rapid increase in coronavirus during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Pop did not pull any punches on our state leaders for reopening the Lone Star State. The bubble is not Florida. You know, the bubble is, like I said, probably one of the safest places you can be, especially compared to outside the bubble in Arizona or Texas or Florida. I mean, you know, we've, we've been all over the map in Texas. Nobody knows what the hell's going on. Uh, you, you, know, you know, we have a lieutenant governor who decided he doesn't want to listen to Fauci and those people anymore. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Come on. How safe can that be? The messaging is ridiculous. The governor goes back and forth based on whether he has to satisfy Trump or listen to the numbers or politics shows that maybe he better do this because the virus has done that. But no overall policy, no principle. It's all about politics. It's all about what's good for them. Uh, and them mostly means Trump because they're all cowards and they're all afraid of him. So being in the bubble is way safer. And the Spurs have revealed that Trey Lyles has come down with a case of appendicitis. He'll miss the entire restart of the season for the Spurs. It's a major setback since the Spurs are counting on Lyles to help fill in for the injured LaMarcus Aldridge. The dominoes are starting to fall. The likelihood of having a high school football season to fall during the COVID-19 pandemic is looking iffy at best. As we told you first on the night B last night, the Austin Travis Interim Health Authority, Dr. Mark Escott, has ordered all school districts and private schools in the county to delay reopening on campus instruction until after September the 7th. But it includes no extracurricular activities, including sports, until students are allowed to return to campus, meaning it wipes out the first two weeks of their high school football season in the Austin area. That will affect the Judson Rockets who were set to renew their rivalry with Lake Travis on September the 4th in commerce. Rockets coach Roddy Williams reveals that's not the only thing that has been lost due to the coronavirus. We have Lake Travis week two, and um, I was talking to Coach Carter last night when he came out, so it's looking like that, that, probably game, that game probably won't happen. Uh, I talked to Claude Mathis up in DeSoto a couple weeks ago, and we were already kind of planning maybe for not being able to play just from everything that's going on. So as of right now, it's kind of a wait and see and, and uh, try to figure some things out from there. It means the Rockets would be out their first two games of the season. Odago County has taken it a step further as their local health authority has ordered all schools, both public and private, not to open before September 27th. And as such, no extracurricular activities, including high school football, can take place. And Mayor Ron Nuremberg announcing today that San Antonio Metro Health is forming a task force that could issue similar orders for 17 area school districts. For the Wagner Thunderbirds, they will open with the Johnson Jaguars on August the 28th, followed by the Stephen Falcons. But in their third week, September the 10th, they're scheduled to host a radio Alexander. That's before the Laredo health officials have decided to lay on campus instruction at the same time, delay the start of extracurricular activities that includes high school football until after September the 4th because of the rise of coronavirus cases. Barring an extension, that game in Rutledge Stadium would still be able to be played, but the Thunderbirds head coach understands if it is not. I just think the safety of our kids, the safety of our staff, and for everybody in our community is important. And um, if our season's delayed, I would totally understand it because it's about safety. And remember, these emergency orders just don't affect high school football, also affects volleyball, cross country, tennis, and even ban. No Dak deal and his brother is not happy. Next. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The deadline has come and gone and no new long-term contract extension for Cowboy star quarterback Dak Prescott. Today was a deadline at three San Antonio time, but no great surprise after Dak signed his franchise tag. They were paying $31.4 million. And even the Cowboys tag him again next year when he becomes a free agent, Dak can still make in the neighborhood of $69 million over the next two years and still sign an extension down the road. You can count Dak's brother Tad as one who's not happy with today's developments. He tweeted out, there is a reason I was never a Dallas Cowboys fan growing up but before they drafted Dak after today who knows how much longer I'll be cheering for them.
Texas junior running back Keontae Ingram has been named to the Doak Walker Awards watch list, which is given out each year to the nation's top college running back. In his first two seasons, Ingram has rushed for over 1,500 yards and 10 touchdowns. Joining Ingram on the Doak Walker Awards watch list is Aggie sophomore running back Isaiah Spiller after leading all SEC freshman running backs with 946 yards rushing. And I believe there's going to be more to come over the next couple of days about high school football and whether or not it's going to continue. Yeah, and we're going to talk with the mayor coming up here shortly, and we'll see what he has to say on the subject. He'll be a very good source for that. Yeah, I'll say Greg Simmons has a question. <laughs> I just, yes, yeah. I do. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> well, pictures from the Trump administration have some prominent product placement. The latest following the Goya backlash coming up. And our community facing the coronavirus crisis, our live Q KSAT Q&A with Mayor Ron Nurnberg is up next. Separating fact from fiction out there, it's KSAT Q&A. We are joined as we are every Wednesday night by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg to go through the latest developments, kind of what's happening with schools. And it, you talked about today during the briefing that Metro Health has set up a task force to look at what will happen with schools. Why the decision to set up a task force and not just have Metro Health make a decision? Well, there's 17 school districts here in San Antonio, and, and we've been meeting with superintendents and, and waiting for TEA to revise its guidance, uh, which it did this evening. And so there's been active uh, dialogue going on uh, for, for a while now. Uh, but really, we have uh, a COVID-19 community re response coalition that has a number of different organizations and uh, disciplines involved. And, and so this is a great body uh, of um, wisdom and community feedback that we can get some feedback before we we do ultimately have the local health public health authority make those determinations and this is brand new authority uh, bestowed by the texas education agency as of this evening so uh we have some some work to do but i think they'll come up with a good solution to get everybody back to school at an appropriate and safe time. Yeah, what kind of specific things will this task force be looking at and when can we expect to hear something well, they'll be meeting uh, as soon as tomorrow, and I, I anticipate it won't take too long to come up with a set of recommendations that's appropriate for the 17 school districts. And so I would expect that there'll be a directive from the local public health authority uh, by early next week, the latest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're talking about a number of things. Uh, one are, are the number of um, start dates that are currently scheduled. You know, Castle Hills, for instance, starts. Um, was scheduled to start as of, I think, next week. We had SAISD originally starting uh, second week of August, and then it staggers out from there. So start dates. Also, uh, what uh, the inside of a classroom will look like in terms of physical distancing and sanitation, all those things that need to occur for there to be safe conduct. Um, they'll also be talking about, uh, you know, uh, the services that are provided by schools that quite often, Frank, families and students are dependent on that go beyond just classroom instruction. Many students rely on the school to provide uh, a warm meal, a couple warm meals each day. Um, obviously, there, there is a lot of stability that schools provide for families in terms of behavioral um, stability and, and, and you know, working families, uh, you know, it's time uh, for them to, to have focused instruction that they quite often can't get at home. And so there's a lot of things that a school that does it go beyond just classroom instruction that have to be meted out to make sure that there's a, a safe environment ultimately when people return to school. And Travis County's health department last night made a decision that they were not going to open school as scheduled and they just made that a blanket statement yeah. for both public and private schools. Is that what we're going to see because you keep talking about guidelines. Is that what we're going to see from Metro Health or will it be more of you make your own decision but these are the guidelines we're putting in place? I think there'll be uh, I think there'll be some uniformity to the local public health guidance in terms of when it's safe to return. But I do think there'll probably be some flexibility for school districts over you know the the course of the next few months as as each of them returns back in some way, shape, or form. Again, there is you know the, there are 17 school districts in the city of San Antonio, a, a city like Houston or even Austin have, um, you're really just one major school district. This is a very unique situation in San Antonio. So there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, people involved and different resources and level of, of needs 
uh, that we have to consider. But I think Metro Health and the local public health authority will come up with a uniform set of expectations initially. And then I think as we move further into the timeline, there'll be some flexibility, flexibility built in. But again, this is touch and go. We're in a pandemic, things change very quickly. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that as teachers and students return to school, they're returning to a safe environment. That's our number one concern. You know, earlier in this newscast, Mr. Mayor, we uh, showed our viewers those very concerning images of the refrigerated trucks being in, and I think that illustrates just how dire the situation is. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And then also, what's the status of the opening of field hospitals such as uh, Freeman Coliseum? Yeah, um, you know, these are grave subjects to talk about. Um, the, the, the gravity of the situation at the hospitals is such that we have to start, start thinking about surge management from the, the start um, uh, all the way through um, the situation and, and every contingency. And so uh, refrigerator trucks have been staged um, in the event that they're needed. And this is because, you know, hospitals have morgues, but, um, you know, frankly, they're not, um, many of them are not equipped to handle a surge of mortality such that we've seen in COVID-19 and other places. And so these are available in situations like this and, and they're ready for use. Um, at this point, uh, according to um, the, the latest information I have, they, they have not been used yet. Uh, but we're getting very close to that point. And so uh, that just underscores how serious the situation is. We, I ha we have a couple of viewer questions and one, uh, a person w wants to go over again the number of allowed people at gatherings without masks. He says there was a party across the street from his house where 40 to 50 people were in the front yard. Police were called, but no citations were given out. Uh, he was obviously upset about that, and he wanted me to ask specifically the mayor, what is the number of allowed people at gatherings without masks? Uh, none. <laughs> none. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be with groups outside of your own household unit unless you're masked up. And, you know, gatherings of, you know, more than 10 are strictly prohibited. And, and I got to tell you, there is a false sense of security when gathering with people outside of your house that you may be close to, whether they're neighbors or their extended family or friends. You know, this is not a time to be having parties or dinner get togethers that are outside of your household unit. I'm sorry, but that is that is where we're seeing a, a lot of the, the transmission occurring. These highly regulated environments where we can control sanitation and distancing and it's all enforceable like a restaurant, those are much easier environments to control, frankly, than someone's home. So we all have to be uh, especially careful um, in our own homes and, and the kinds of activities we take place. But, but what the viewer is describing is absolutely, it's absolutely um, forbidden right now because these are, are, these are very dangerous things to be, uh, happen, to, to be um, conducting when we have an active uh, community transmission during a pandemic. All right. Absolutely. One more question. This comes from viewer Greg Simmons. He wants to know he wants to know if high school football is going to happen. Do you think high school football is going to happen this year? You know, I, it's it's um, it's hard to say in Texas that uh, high school football and, and intercollegiate athletics will be disrupted, but um, it is almost certain that um, the football team sports right now are going to be disrupted in some way, shape, or form. Uh, it is not um, appropriate, according to the health uh, information that we have, to be conducting the team sport activities. If I think, uh, you know, that there have been a number of um, openings that occurred before the data suggests we're ready and we're, we're seeing that and, and now the new infections that are taking place, and one of those is the uh, one of those things is the youth sports activities that's taking place and that includes the schools um, so there is going to be disruption there's no doubt about that um, but the more we can work together to get this under control as quickly as possible the faster we can get back to life as we know it and that includes football mayor ron nuremberg as always thank you so much for your time great to see you have a great night we'll be right back The backlash against Goya appears to be getting a response from the White House. President Trump promoting Goya Foods products from the Oval Office. A similar tweet posted from his daughter and advisor Ivanka Trump 
Some ethics experts have said that Ivanka Trump's Twitter post might have violated ethics laws for federal employees. The social media posts come after Goya's CEO praised the president last week at a White House event. Democrat Julian Castro tweeted a call to action saying their CEO is, quote, praising a president who villainizes and maliciously attacks Latinos for political gain. Americans should think twice before buying their products, end quote. Florida, the new global epicenter of the virus with over 50 intensive care units completely full. And now the first governor of any state in the U.S. testing positive. All of this as the death toll climbs in half of all states, a total of 137,000 American lives lost. ABC's Zareen Shah has the story. The world's biggest coronavirus hotspot in Miami, Florida, now quickly running out of space to treat patients. Across the state, 56 hospitals without ICU beds. The state reporting 112 lives lost to the virus. Governor Ron DeSantis in a late message today about parents being able to choose if their kids went back to school this fall, despite the current death rate in his state. You know, parents need to have the ability to opt for the type of learning that they, th they think is important. And so if they're com more comfortable in a distance learning environment, uh, then they obviously need to have uh, that, that choice. At least one Florida teacher terrified of going back into the classroom after spending three weeks hooked to a ventilator with the virus. Our immune systems are low as it is. We catch every flu the kids have. Yeah. So we're very susceptible to COVID. Texas close behind Florida in the struggle to fight the coronavirus. 110 deaths today. The state now ready to go with refrigerators for bodies in case the morgues cannot handle any more. Houston is home to one of the world's largest medical facilities, but despite that, Army doctors and nurses arriving there to help. California struggling too. One hard hit hospital with just three ICU beds left. And now the country's first governor testing positive. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt seeing here attending one of the president's rallies without a mask says he believes he got the virus afterward. Meanwhile, Alabama's governor now making masks mandatory. The CDC director echoing that idea, speaking out about how simple it could be to turn the pandemic around. We really embrace masking. We really embrace the social distancing and hand washing. We could bring this outbreak to, a, to its knees. As for that mask order in Alabama, people there could face a $500 fine if they're not wearing one. Now, their governor says she's not asking police to go around looking for people not wearing one. But she says if those numbers don't turn back around, she may have to close things down once again. Soreen Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Take a live look outside with live cam right now, 89 degrees, Adam. 89, another hot day out there today, and we tied a record high temperature, making it up to 102. Let's get right to the current conditions outside right now here in San Antonio. We're at 89, dew point is 63, so it feels like we're at 90, not a big Heat index, not a big factor out there. That dew point, yeah, it's muggy, but it's not really influencing that heat index a whole lot. Locally, we're still in the 80s from 89 New Braunfels, 86 Canyon Lake, 84 Divine, 83 in Kerrville, 86 Randolph, but we still have some 90s farther to the west. Catula Carrizo Springs at 90 degrees, Del Rio at 97, still at this hour, 10.51 p.m., 97 degrees and the humidity surging back into place as usual earlier this afternoon. It dropped off a little bit. However, in the evening and at night, it surges back into place and it's only for a few hours in the afternoon where it drops a bit. We had a little bit of relief earlier today and we'll have it again tomorrow afternoon from the humidity, but it's going to get a lot stickier overnight tonight and you'll really notice it tomorrow morning. So right on the edge of the upper level high, some good rainfall right now in parts of the panhandle of Texas and of course Oklahoma, or Oklahoma, a little bit of Oklahoma, but especially New Mexico, a little bit of severe weather possible there as well in the panhandle. But we're on the dry side of this and there is one feature that we're looking at here, which actually produced some pretty good rainfall earlier today during the peak heating of the day. Some good rainfall in southern Alabama and Mississippi, even down toward New Orleans, Panhandle of Florida. That's this inverted trough. It's basically, you know how we often talk about those dips in the upper level flow? Well, this is one of those. It's just upside down, okay? So that's what it is. It's an inverted trough, a little disturbance in the atmosphere. This is going to be moving backwards, moving westward toward us over the next couple of days. And tomorrow, it's still going to be out over the Gulf of Mexico. It's going to weaken and lose some of its luster. But by the time it makes it here Friday, 
it gives us a very slight chance of a few showers. That's mainly east of I-35, so mostly along the coastal plain do we have that slight chance of rain. And when I say slight, I mean about 20%. I think that's the best we can do with that disturbance. Tomorrow morning, we'll start the day at 77. Some clouds early, otherwise another very sunny day tomorrow. And of course, hot. But that said, we're trimming off a few more degrees. We went from 97 on or 107 on Monday to 105 yesterday, 102 today, and we're keeping that trend down to 100 for the high temperature tomorrow afternoon. Then we're down into the upper 90s Friday through the weekend. There's that just tiny slight chance of rain, especially east of town on Friday. And then as we get into next week, we could see another one of those little disturbances move toward us, but don't get your hopes up for any rainfall. I mean, right now we're talking 10 to 20% chances at best. Thank you, Adam. I think <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the importance of access to health care and health insurance. But as we're all probably aware, sometimes simply understanding policies and which plans fit best for each person it's a challenge in and of itself. For this week's episode of KSAT Explains, RJ Marquez spoke with Lawrence Richardson, who has faced obstacles in the process. It's been like a lot of hell. Lawrence has worked at Home Depot for the past couple of years, but because he's part time, coverage options are limited. And because he has cerebral palsy, he needs full coverage. I have to have certain kind of insurance because all insurance doesn't cover your, um, your, um, your, 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 your wheelchair equipment. So you got to find insurance, you got to find a company for that. And like, it's just a lot. During the year he was uninsured, Lawrence was forced to get creative. I was just trying to make my medication stretch, which I did, thank God, but I did my medication. I, I went to see, I only went to the doctor when I had, like, literally had to, like when I was, you know, about to die. He also had to rely more on help from his friends. Like I have in a, a mango chair and an electric chair. And to get that picture to the company you got it from, you have to have the insurance. And like, so basically I would have to get one of my friends or whoever to come and look at my chair and see what's wrong with it. I have a strong group of friends that, you know, look out for me. So. Lawrence said he tried to get insurance again, but got very frustrated trying to find the right people to talk to. That's when he came into contact with Connectability. That's an organization that helps people with disabilities navigate the medical system. With Connectability's help, Lawrence got coverage through Medicare. He's continued to work at Home Depot through the pandemic with more peace of mind that if something were to happen, he is covered. And not to mention, he says now that he's not spending so much money on medication and doctor's appointments, he's able to be more independent than he would otherwise be. RJ Marcus, KSAT 12 News. Case had explains the people impacted by the pandemic will be available to stream on demand tomorrow. You can watch it on the KSAT TV app available on Roku. Amazon Fire Stick or most other smart TV devices. You can also find it at ksat.com slash explains. Several type of mass, types of masks were put to the test. What one study is revealing about their effectiveness. Next on the Night Beat. Health experts and government officials alike are pushing the importance of wearing face masks to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. With so many different mask types out there, you may be wondering which ones are going to protect you and others the best. The answer may surprise you. According to a study at Florida Atlantic University, well-fitted masks made from two layers of tightly stitched cotton fabric are the best when it comes to blocking the droplets from coughs. Researchers compared the effectiveness of these masks with three other styles of face coverings, loosely folded cloth masks, bandana style coverings, and cone style masks. Using a mannequin head, a manual pump, a smoke generator, and a laser, researchers were able to emulate a person's sneezing or coughing and then trace how far the droplets traveled. With a two layer stitch cloth mask, the potential virus droplets only traveled two and a half inches from the wearer. The second most effective was the cone style mask with droplets going approximately eight inches out from the mask. The folded handkerchief and bandana styles proved least effective with leakage expanding from one to three feet. If someone with no face covering coughs or sneezes, those droplets can travel up to eight feet around them. 
Some masks are also being put to the test here at home. Some are being described as counterfeit masks from overseas. Right now on KSAT.com, you can read about how Southwest Research Institute is testing masks for hospitals to ensure the safety of their workers. And coming up, a new campaign that is people literally embracing nature. Tree huggers, <laughs> the reason next. Well, check this out. It gives the term tree hugger a whole new meaning. Israel's Nature and Parks Authority is suggesting on social media that you that if you can't embrace friends and family amid the COVID-19 pandemic, to hug a tree instead. Officials say it can help people feeling socially detached while getting out in nature. Israel's com campaign follows a similar one launched three months ago in Iceland. I like the lady who hugged it and gave it a pat. Yes. You see that? <laughs> a Wisconsin man who's won multiple prestigious beard competitions has shaved it off for a good cause. Jason Kiley raised nearly $9,000 for the African American Round Table in Milwaukee to promote racial justice. With the help of Sam's Cut and Color Salon in La Crosse, Kylie now rocks just a mustache. I have been that to La That is one amazing beard. I have been to La Crosse, Wisconsin before. Yeah. Did you know, and Adam, you maybe appreciate this? I was going to say, let's hear this. La Crosse, Wisconsin has the most bars per capita. <laughs> it's also the home of G. Heileman Brewing. There you okay, go. Okay, that's new to me. So that was reason enough for me to go there. <laughs> yes. Good night. <laughs>